Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, kindly sponsored by Feline Friends. I'm delighted you're able to join this evening. My name's Rich Daly and I'm going to be your chair for this evening and I'm also the head of sales for the webinar vet. Before um, we start tonight's uh, presentation on the topic of kidney disease in cats, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping for those who haven't joined us before and just a reminder for those who have. Um, throughout the web, uh, the presentation will run throughout, um, and you, but you're, please, we do encourage you to post any questions you may have throughout the presentation, as there will be time at the end to ask the speaker those questions. So please, as you click come up, think of the questions. All you need to do is at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box that says Q&A. Click that, type in your question, and then I will have a bit of time to present them to uh, Sarah at the end of this presentation. If you have any queries regarding um, not being able to see the presentation or if you've got any issues with sound, please do pop that in the chat box by clicking that um, once again on the bottom of the screen, type in the message and my colleague Luke is on hand to uh, answer any of those queries you may have or alternatively you can email office at thewebinarvet.com and they'll be able to answer them that way as well. So. On to tonight's speaker. I'm delighted that we're joined by Sarah Caney. Sarah is graduated from the University of Bristol, which is where she also completed her residency in feline medicine and PhD. Sarah is a specialist in feline medicine with the RCVS and enjoys a mixture of first opinion and referral feline patients. Uh, for those who are eager bookworms, uh, you may know uh, Sarah's name because she's written a number of books uh, on topics such as um, caring for a cat with chronic kidney disease, caring for a cat with hypothyroidism, and caring for a cat with lower urinary tract disease, all published by her cat company, Cat Professional. So I'm sure many of you are well aware of the fantastic work that Sarah's done. And um, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Sarah and uh, let her take through the world, uh, talk you through the world of kidney disease in cats. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much and um, thank you all too for choosing to tune into this webinar. I really hope you're going to find it a useful experience. I, I'm guessing that um, many of you will have had the experience of caring for a cat with kidney disease because sadly it is quite a common illness that cats suffer from. But it's actually one that I often feel very positive about because over the years, and I've been working as a feline-only vet for more than 20 years now, I've seen massive improvements in our ability both to diagnose and to manage this condition. And whereas certainly 20 years ago, it often was a bit of a sad diagnosis to make, I'm really happy to say that um, nowadays, thanks to all of the advances in treatments available, um, it's often not such a devastating diagnosis. There's a lot we can do to support affected cats. So I hope you're going to find this presentation helpful in informing you about this condition and what you as a carer can do to help spot this disease at the earliest possible stage in your cat and also to help manage the condition in your cat. So you've already heard uh, a little bit about me in the introduction. This slide just summarises um, who I am and uh, a little bit of my background. So I'm uh, based in the UK for um, any overseas listeners to this webinar. I actually uh, live up in Scotland um, and it really enjoys seeing a mixture of feline cases up here, have a particular passion for the elderly cat um, and kidney disease is one of the most common conditions affecting elderly cats. You've heard already about some of the books that my company publishes and there's some covers of uh, books here and I have authored and uh, co-authored several of these um, but there are a range of topics that you can see and you'll be able to read more about those on my website um, if those are of interest. Also on my website there is a lot of free to access information um, and if you go to vetprofessionals.com and look for the helpful info top menu you can see um, that you can access some video guides, you can also access uh, quite a large number of technical guides which are called the free downloads um, and learn more about uh, CKD and also many other uh, common feline conditions. So I hope you will consider visiting my website and accessing those resources. 
I recently started a health blog on the website um, that also is accessible under that helpful info menu and the first topic was chronic kidney disease so very relevant to tonight's webinar. And last but not least, I'd just like to mention that I do, through my website, do some online research, primarily with cat owners. Um, and I'll mention some of the results of that research in this webinar because one of my most recent studies related to kidney disease in cats. But I would like to take the opportunity just now um, to actually thank any of you that have participated in any of the online surveys uh, that we run. Really, really appreciate your contribution to this research. And it's been an absolutely invaluable way of learning more about the carer's experience of a number of illnesses. You can access currently open surveys through the survey tab on the vetprofessionals.com homepage. And we have, for example, a, a survey currently running on um, nutrition of cats, what you feed your cat and your uh, attitude to different aspects of uh, feeding your cat. So if you've not already participated in that study, I'd really love um, to see some more data for that. So thank you in advance for that. So in this presentation, I'm aiming to speak for about 40 minutes and the plan is to cover these topics. So what do the kidneys do? Where are they in the body? What happens when the kidneys are damaged? And what is this disease that we call chronic kidney disease? What does that mean to the cat? How can you spot it as a carer? How is it diagnosed by a vet? How do we suggest it's managed? And what does the future hold for a cat diagnosed with this condition? So we're going to look at each of these topics in turn, starting with the first one, where are the kidneys? And uh, I can answer that question by showing you a cat's x-ray. So this is a, a lateral abdominal x-ray of a cat. So if you imagine your cat lying on its side, you're standing above it looking down, this is the film, uh, the view you would get if you actually took an x-ray of, of your cat's abdomen. And you may be looking at that thinking, well, there's some black and white and some grey, but what am I actually looking at? If I now put some um, annotations on there, you can see that we have at the top the spine or the backbone. And then below that, we have the abdomen with the liver um, in, the, in the front portion of the abdomen, so closest to the chest on the left-hand side of the picture. The stomach has a little bit of air in it, so shows as a not quite black, but uh, certainly a, a, a darker density. Behind that liver, um, we have some loops of intestine and, and bladder, and you can also see the kidneys I've labelled um, below the backbone um, in, in the sort of uh, first to middle portion of that abdomen. And in this particular view, the kidneys, and of course we all know we're born with two kidneys, one on each side, but they're actually superimposed. So um, it's not easy to see them as individual structures. If I outline them just now with some dotted lines, you can see that they are lying on top of each other, which is why uh, we have this difficulty in seeing them as two discrete structures. I'll take away those dotted lines again now so you can see, see the kidneys. If we were to take a different view of that abdomen with our cat lying on their back, we would be able to see one kidney on each side. So that's where the kidneys are. But what do the kidneys do? Well, again, I think most of us will have a certain degree of knowledge about what kidneys do from our biology lessons at school and uh, perhaps uh, other aspects of our education. And we will remember that, for example, their primary role is excretory and that they are responsible for excreting waste products from the body into the urine, which is this liquid which then is passed from the bladder um, to the outside. And so kidneys perform a very important role in excretion of a number of products, some protein breakdown products, also medication that we give to our cat is often excreted through the kidneys, poisons if our cat comes into contact with them may be excreted through the kidneys, and also a number of hormones, um, chemicals produced in the body that are needed for maintaining normal health. Uh, some of these are also excreted by the kidneys. But in addition to their excretory role, they also perform a number of other really 
very life important tasks to regulate and maintain what we call homeostasis. So keeping everything within the normal parameters and that includes regulation of normal hydration. So preventing dehydration and also over hydration. So we want everything to be just right. Also maintaining normal blood levels of certain salts, what we call electrolytes, and also maintaining a normal blood acidity, what we call acid base status. The kidney is also very important in regulation of normal blood pressure in the body. And a number of hormones are either produced in the kidneys or activated in the kidneys. Um, an example of one of these would be the hormone erythropoietin, a hormone that's produced in the kidneys and that's responsible for stimulating production of red blood cells by the bone marrow. So when we come to think of a cat with kidney disease, just thinking of that one example, it may be that our cat with kidney disease becomes vulnerable to anemia because they are not producing as much of that hormone erythropoietin. So you can see immediately that kidneys are very complicated organs. And if we look next at the patient that perhaps has damaged kidneys, kidneys that are not functioning perfectly, there are an awful lot of things that can potentially go wrong, um, including the anemia that I've just mentioned, but also, as you can see, dehydration, accumulation of toxins and breakdown products in the bloodstream, which can make our cats feel sick, problems with their blood salt levels, problems with their blood acidity, problems with their blood pressure. So a lot of different things that may be affected in a cat with kidney disease. You are very unlucky if as a cat you have all of these as problems. Each individual tends to have different challenges with their kidney disease. But as a vet, it's very important for me to look at each patient and, and try and work out which of these possibilities are present and which things I can help with. And, and thankfully, as I, I mentioned at the start of this presentation, there are an awful lot of things that, that we can help with. So next, I wanted to just spend a, a minute uh, defining this chronic kidney disease um, illness that I mentioned briefly at the start. CKD is the most common category of kidney disease that we see in cats, this very common problem, particularly in elderly cats. And you may have heard some other terms that are actually also describing this same condition. So um, some other common terms I've listed on here include renal insufficiency and renal failure. And renal insufficiency describes the, the milder form of disease where in the early stages of disease, perhaps the cat appears quite healthy, but the kidneys are showing that they are damaged by no longer being able to produce as concentrated urine as is normal for them. And you will know, or you may know, that cats originally um, have adapted from being desert dwelling creatures. So they're very, very good at surviving with very, very little fluid. And this is because their kidneys are extremely well adapted to produce a very small volume of very concentrated urine. So basically keeping the available water that they need in the body and uh, preventing dehydration. But if sadly your kidneys are not working as well as they should, one of the first things that changes is that the kidneys are no longer able to produce as concentrated urine as they were in the past. And a measure of urine concentration, what we call the USG, which is the urine specific gravity, starts to fall. And uh, the number that we use as vets to indicate that, that there is a problem um, is 1035. So you can see about halfway down this slide, I've put uh, USG less than 1035. That is the cutoff where we as vets think, hmm, this is not right for a cat. Uh, kidney disease is one possibility. There are other illnesses that can also affect uh, ability to produce concentrated urine. So it's not in itself a diagnosis of CKD. But typically at this point, the cat is still actually quite well. Um, it's not typically showing other clinical signs of illness. So um, it's, in, it's in the early stages, hence being called this renal insufficiency. It's a sort of milder form of the disease. Cats in, in renal failure, the disease has progressed to the point where 
the kidneys now are, are no longer able to perform their normal excretory roles. So they are unable to excrete those protein waste products and hormones that, that we talked about as well as they should. And as a consequence, we see buildup of these products in the bloodstream. And azotemia um, is the word that we use to describe the situation where um, blood levels of protein uh, breakdown products are higher than they should be. And if we have that in combination with this dilute urine, that gives us the diagnosis of kidney disease. Nowadays, I very much encourage vets to use the term CKD for all cats with this condition. So rather than talking about renal insufficiency and renal failure, to use that overall term CKD. Um, and part of the reason for that is that, of course, it is a spectrum between these two. Um, it's not that the cat suddenly moves from one category to another. There is a, a, a sort of gray uh, line between these two. But also, I think uh, the term renal failure sounds um, very negative. It sounds you know, quite depressing. Um, and I imagine not the sort of thing you want to be told that your cat has. But also, from my perspective, is unnecessarily depressing because many cats that have this azotemic renal disease, so fairly advanced kidney disease, actually still are possible to stabilize for many years. So we don't need to use that sort of negative word failure. And the relevance as well of the word chronic when we talk about this kidney disease is just that this is a disease that's been present for some time. So chronic doesn't mean severe, it just means that the disease has been present typically for a, a few months or longer. So that's got some of the sort of heavy science and definitions out of the way. Um, let's now look at a little bit more at this condition and also how carers can spot this condition. So firstly, just from a little bit of background, um, this is a very common condition, as I've already said, and as I think you probably all know, it is estimated to affect more than a third uh, of cats that are aged 10 years and over. So a huge number of our cats, sadly, are vulnerable to developing chronic kidney disease. And we do know that there are certain things that can actually damage the kidneys, um, which include, as I've listed here, things like toxins. So if your cat um, eats part of a lily plant, that can cause damage to the kidneys. Certain medications can cause damage to the kidneys as well. Infections, for example, bacterial infection of the kidneys can damage the kidneys. Um, Tumours can damage the kidneys. Um, and some cats are unlucky in that they have inherited diseases affecting the kidneys. An example of that being polycystic disease, where um, very commonly, um, unfortunately, in Persian cats and related breeds, the kidneys um, develop with these little cysts, these little fluid pockets within them that gradually enlarge through the cat's life and eventually um, cause uh, signs associated with CKD. So we do know that about a number of causes of, of kidney damage, but actually in most cats where we make a diagnosis of CKD, it's not possible to say what's caused it because perhaps that toxic insult or infection has gone now we're just left with the end stage damage and the management for these cases is is the same irrespective of that uh, initial cause of disease so how does the illness manifest in the cat? What sort of signs might you as a carer spot? Well, this is one slide where I wanted to share some data from an owner survey that I published a few years ago in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. And you can read a summary of the data uh, from this study um, uh, through uh, my website and also through contacting me if this is of interest. Um, it involved 859 cats um, owned by UK cat owners. Um, who had experienced this uh, CKD condition and these owners um, were very happy for me to report their findings, uh, what they'd experienced in their cats. Um, and this slide summarizes what signs um, they had noticed in their cat as evident that the cat was not feeling very well. And you can see the most common sign was an increase in the cat's thirst. But even though that's the most common sign, firstly, it's only about half of the cats. So about the, about half of the cats, the other half of the cats, if you like, the owners hadn't spotted any change in thirst. Um, and also important to note that an increased thirst is not in itself diagnostic of CKD. There are other conditions that can also cause an increase in thirst. Diabetes would be an, another example. 
The increase in thirst is commonly seen because these cats are unable to produce that concentrated urine. So as I mentioned in an earlier slide, when the kidneys are damaged, one of the things that happens is that they're less able to produce that very strong, very concentrated urine. So the urine that your cat produces is more watery and more dilute, and therefore the cat has to drink more to stop themselves from becoming dehydrated. Weight loss, very common, that increased volume of urine produced, noticed also by a lot of owners. Um, of course, if your cat doesn't use a litter box, it may be impossible for you to know how much urine uh, the cat is passing. But if your cat does use a litter box, you may appreciate either an increase in number of urine clumps or increased size of those clumps. The litter tray may feel heavier. So that's another thing to look out for. And then other signs would include a poor appetite, just the cat being out of sorts, off colour, just not right, and also vomiting. Again, none of these signs are absolutely specific for CKD. They will occur also with other illnesses, but presence of any of these should be something that prompts you to speak to your vet about your cat and obviously um, get them checked out So, in case CKD or other illnesses are present. As I've put on the right hand side of this slide, it is also important to remember that many cats with CKD, particularly in the earlier stages of disease, may appear to be completely healthy. And this is often a very gradually progressive condition. So it can sort of sneak up on you as a carer. And in particular, weight loss, when you're living with your cat and seeing your cat every day, can be difficult for a carer to spot. Um, and this is where um, preventative health checks, healthy cat checks, um, also become important to try and pick these early symptoms at the earliest possible opportunity. So whilst in the majority, most cats with CKD are diagnosed because you as a carer spot there's something wrong with your cat, you bring it to your vet, um, they ask you some questions, they do an examination, they collect some, some blood and urine samples and that makes the diagnosis. I would also like to draw your attention to that possibility of early diagnosis and screening apparently healthy cats. And indeed, about 10% of the cats um, reported in my own series, which I mentioned, had been diagnosed um, on a wellness check. So this really is an important and helpful way of picking up diseases like CKD at the earliest possible opportunity. You may be aware of a charity called International Cat Care. Their website is icatcare.org, but they recently have launched some guidelines for life stage appropriate checks of cats. So in other words, the health checks that are recommended for your cat at different ages. And what they recommend is that for cats aged up to seven years, um, it is adequate to have a once a year check, which is a general recommendation by most vets. Um, that should include a weight check and a general, um, what we call a history, asking you questions and a physical examination of the cat. But that once the cat reaches the mature life stage, which is cats aged seven to 10 years of age, it's sensible to expand that checkup to include a blood pressure check, and if possible, some blood and urine profiles to look for evidence of common old cat conditions, which would include CKD, but also things like hypothyroidism and diabetes mellitus. For the senior cats, those aged 11 to 14 years, um, it's suggested that we try and see those cats every six months for the same sort of check. Um, and where possible in our blood work, we include a T4 test, which is a test for hypothyroidism and overactive thyroid. And similarly for the super senior age group, which previously was what we call geriatric cats, but now in a more celebratory tone, we call these the super seniors, um, that we should see these cats ideally um, every six months. I actually prefer to do a health check in these cats every three months, if at all possible. And by health check, I mean really wanting as a minimum to talk to, to you and find out how you feel your cat is doing, to examine your cat, and importantly, to weigh your cat um, so that I can really understand how, how their health is in general. But where possible, six to 12 monthly, uh, we also want to assess blood pressure and our blood work uh, as uh, already discussed and our, our urine tests.
You can read more about these life stage checks on um, the Cat Care for Life uh, website, which is one uh, designed specifically by International Cat Care to support these health guidelines. So in illustrating the importance of simple things like weight assessments, um, this is the only scientific paper that I, I think I've got a picture of in my presentation. So again, don't want to sort of bombard you with too much science. Um, but this was a study that was published a few years ago where more than 500 cats uh, were diagnosed with CKD. But the authors of the paper had access to these cats' weight records going back for several years preceding the cat's diagnosis of kidney problems. And what they found was that actually weight loss commonly preceded diagnosis. And in fact, these cats were often losing up to 10% of their body weight, which is the equivalent of someone who weighs about 10 stones, losing one stone in body weight, so a huge amount of body weight, lost in the year preceding diagnosis. And in fact, when they looked even further back, they could see that the cat had been losing weight for several years. And also, as, as shown in this red box, the cats with the lower body weight tended to have the, the, the worse long-term outlook, um, which indicates to me that, again, we should try and make the diagnosis as early as possible. And a key message from this, really, for me, is not to ignore weight loss. So just a simple thing like assessing weight um, can really help us to pick up illnesses. CKD is, is one important example, but other illnesses also will commonly cause weight loss in your cat. I also mentioned blood pressure checks as being recommended by iCat Care, and this is something that I strongly support. Um, just as is the case in people, high blood pressure can be very damaging. It can actually be fatal. And it's often called a silent killer in people because the signs of high blood pressure often are not noticeable until um, the disease is very advanced. And this uh, top picture of uh, the cat on the left-hand side, this cat, poor, poor little Audrey, you can probably even appreciate looking at the photo. She is completely blind. Her eyes look like saucers. She's got very, very big pupils. And this was sadly because she had high blood pressure that had caused both of her retinas to detach. And whilst treating her high blood pressure, we were able to improve her vision far better, of course, to make the diagnosis of high blood pressure before it's caused um, these very severe signs. So we want to assess blood pressure where at all possible. Um, in the case of, of CKD patients, it's particularly important because high blood pressure is a very well acknowledged complication of CKD, affecting up to 60% of cats with CKD. So we really need to keep a closer eye on their blood pressure um, than ever before. And the good news is that if we do find the blood pressure is high, it's often very straightforward to treat. And there are a couple of licensed medications for treating blood pressure in cats, uh, which both work very, very effectively. Another aspect of our uh, preventative healthcare check, these sort of checks of, of apparently healthy cats that I mentioned, was a urine test. And the key things we want to look at here won't come as a surprise to you in, in that we want to look at urine concentration um, because of what I've said about CKD and that affecting the cat's ability to produce concentrated urine. So as I was saying a little bit earlier on, uh, we want to look at urine concentration. If that USG is less than 1035, that sets off an alarm bell with us. And it means that we want to do further investigations to see whether the cat has CKD or another condition that will uh, have had an impact on its ability to produce concentrated urine. And for example, a dipstick test um, can be helpful um, in confirming whether or not the cat has diabetes mellitus, which also typically will uh, cause a reduction in the USG. The refractometer, the photo at the bottom of the slide, is the instrument we use to measure urine-specific gravity. It's a very quick and easy test to do. And of course, we do this on a urine sample. We don't necessarily even need the cat in the clinic. Um, you may be able to collect a urine sample at home, bring it into the clinic. If you're worried about your cat's thirst, we can check the urine sample um, and let you know whether there is anything to worry about. We also can collect urine samples from cats using a procedure called cystocentesis, and the top photo shows a cat having a urine sample collected in that way. So it's very much like a blood sample in that it involves a needle going through the skin. Um, but this is, again, a very straightforward procedure, um, which most cats are absolutely fine to have done. 
And if we do find that the cat has got kidney disease, doing a more detailed urine panel is helpful to understand more about the kidney disease. I mentioned that home collection of urine samples um, is often very helpful, particularly if you do think your cat is drinking a little bit more than it used to. Um, and there are some resources on my website. So in the free download section, there is a guide for carers on how to collect a urine sample from your cat at home. Um, and most cats, particularly elderly cats, um, actually are fine to, to collect a urine sample. We, we have a special non-absorbent cat litter. We can find the, the, the cat with the tray containing just that non-absorbent litter most cats will oblige us with a urine sample within a few hours and it can be brought into the clinic for testing Blood tests are the last aspect that I mentioned as part of the sort of healthy cat check, but also, of course, very important in those cats where we're suspicious of an illness such as CKD. And what we're looking at here in terms of making a diagnosis of CKD is evidence of that reduced excretory function, which might be accumulation of things in the bloodstream that are normally excreted by the kidneys. So things like creatinine and urea, and also more recently, SDMA, which is, uh, these are all substances that are produced during protein breakdown and normally excreted by the kidneys. And we can look at these levels um, and learn more about the cat's kidney function and, and whether or not uh, they are um, compatible with the diagnosis of CKD. But importantly, there are, uh, there are other things that we want to look for in our blood screen um, if we confirm CKD, but also other things that we want to look at if possible as part of our routine health screening that might pick up other common old cat illnesses such as hypothyroidism and diabetes mellitus. If we confirm a diagnosis of CKD, then it definitely is an advantage where at all possible to really gather as much information about our patient. Um, because as you'll see when we talk about management, um, understanding each individual's situation in, in the most detail really does help us to produce the, the best individualized, most appropriate plan. So this is, uh, includes us doing, a, for example, a blood count to look for anemia, looking for those blood salt problems perhaps, perhaps also looking for uh, problems with the blood acidity as I mentioned earlier on, uh, doing a detailed urine profile to look for evidence of infection and where possible scanning the kidneys, imaging the kidneys so that we can understand whether or not there are structural changes there. Um, for example, I mentioned um, the uh, cats that can suffer from this inherited um, cystic kidney condition and that bottom right picture shows uh, a cat with polycystic kidney disease where you can hopefully appreciate there are lots of black circles and those are all fluid filled cysts within the kidney and that fluid filled cyst is putting pressure on normal kidney tissue unfortunately leading to the destruction of that normal tissue, which is why these cats then start to develop signs of kidney disease. We have a normal kidney on the left and one in the middle that is just a, a perhaps a more typical CKD kidney where we have that less well-defined kidney as evidence of it being scarred um, and a little bit damaged. So if we can, doing these tests is helpful because it allows us to, to uh, produce a treatment plan that's in the best interests of that patient. So what does the diagnosis of CKD mean for your cat? Well, the bad news is that this is not a condition that your cat can ever fully recover from. Damage to the kidneys is permanent. Um, the end result of that damage is scarring. The kidneys can't regenerate. They can't sort of grow new nephrons, which are the functional unit of the kidneys, and repair themselves. And also, sadly, CKD is considered to be a progressive condition. In other words, it always gets worse with time, partly because of the compensatory mechanisms that are, are stimulated in the body to try and cope with that reduced kidney function. Unfortunately, some of these have a negative consequence on the kidneys that can lead to further progression um, of the kidney damage. But there are lots of things that we can do to support cats affected by CKD that can help to slow the progression of disease and improve quality and length of life. Um, and lots of cats, in, including all the cats pictured in this slide, can do extremely well, even those with really very severe kidney disease. Often it's possible to stabilize them um, and often, I think, for years nowadays, which is a really, really positive thing. 
So how do we manage this condition? Well, first of all, first of all, if we can um, look for any underlying and ongoing disease like a kidney infection that would benefit from treatment, then that's very helpful because if we can find something like that and treat something like that, then we can stop further damage to the kidneys. Beyond that, there are um, a couple of strategies that um, are aimed at slowing the progression of disease. And the most proven of those is feeding a specially formulated therapeutic diet, which often people call a kidney diet. Um, but more recently, also a lot of interest in medications which suppress the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which we abbreviate to the RAS. This is one of the compensatory mechanisms that is triggered in a cat with kidney disease to try and support the excretion, uh, the excretory role that kidneys have, but sadly, which has some negative consequences on, on the cat overall. So there are some medications we can use that, that suppress that RAS. And then beyond that, there are a lot of treatments that we can use which will improve our patient's quality of life. So, for example, that might include medications to help with appetite, to help if there is nausea or vomiting, to manage high blood pressure, uh, to manage anemia. So an awful lot of different things that can be done. Um, and all of these are discussed in great detail in, in my book, Caring for a Cat with Chronic Kidney Disease, which uh, you may find a useful addition to this webinar. The special diet is definitely the most important and helpful thing you can do. Um, and the main um, rationale for this diet is that we want to limit the amount of phosphate that we feed to our cat with CKD. The kidneys normally are responsible for excreting any excess phosphate in the body. And unfortunately, as soon as you have any problem with your kidneys, you will become vulnerable to what we call phosphate retention, accumulation of phosphate in the body. And that has a lot of very negative consequences which contribute to our cats both feeling ill um, and also their kidney disease progressing more rapidly. So if we can phosphate restrict, limit the amount of phosphate that they can eat, we can actually have a big impact on their prognosis, on their outlook. So how do we phosphate restrict our patients? Well, firstly, um, not strictly phosphate restriction, but if we can maintain a normal hydration in our cats, so if we can prevent them from being dehydrated, um, then we can support the kidneys to work to their very best abilities. So do all you can to encourage your cat to drink. And there are a lot of tips in, in uh, one of my guides in the free download section uh, on how to encourage a cat to drink that you might find helpful. Things like making broths for your cat to drink, um, as well as more obvious things like feeding a wet diet if possible rather than a dry food. We then move on to phosphate restriction proper and the two ways that we can do that um, which can be used together or independently are firstly feeding a specially designed phosphate restricted food such as the kidney diets I mentioned Senior cat foods tend to be a little bit phosphate restricted. So if your cat won't eat the kidney food, the senior diet is, is probably the next best thing. Um, and we can also um, avoid things that we know are particularly high in phosphate, which include things like uh, dairy products. The other way we can phosphate restrict our cat is by adding a substance called a phosphate binder to their food. Um, and this uh, typically is a substance which we, is designed to be given with the food. Um, it sticks to phosphate in the food and then prevents it from being absorbed so that the phosphate and the binder are passed out in the cat's feces. So of all the things you can do for your cat with CKD, feeding a specially designed therapeutic diet is definitely the most helpful thing. And there are a number of publications that have shown that if your cat with CKD will eat a specially designed diet, its lifespan will be extended by two to three times. So we're typically talking about several years here. And this is primarily down to the phosphate restriction, but there are a number of other characteristics of the kidney diet that also make them uh, helpful for a cat with CKD. For example, being often high in fat, very high in calorie, which helps that cat with a poor appetite to maintain their body condition. 
there are a huge number of different therapeutic renal diets available um, and I've shown some of them on this slide and also listed some of them on this slide but there are others beyond this um, and the good news is that all of the pet food companies work very hard constantly to expand their range of available foods so for example within the individual com companies like Royal Canyon and Hills they actually have several kidney diets for cats in different flavors and different formulations so there are a lot of things you can try um, and hopefully you'll find some that your cat likes as well that of course is, is, is always a challenge my top tips for success in terms of transitioning your cat into one of these foods is that remember although this is the most helpful thing that you can do for your cat it should be a long-term aim so don't don't get despondent if you know one or two days in your cat is turning up its nose at the food you're offering it you are doing the right thing but it can take a long time particularly for a cat that's not feeling 100 percent well to accept a new diet and you will sadly unless you've conveniently got a labrador living in your house be throwing away a, a lot of cat food that your, your cat just won't want to eat so try not to get too too depressed about that remember that you are doing a fantastic job by encouraging your cat to consider this kidney diet also remember that it's always more important that your cat eats something than nothing so if the cat doesn't like the kidney diet offer it something that it will eat um, and it doesn't matter whether that is you know a supermarket uh, diet or eat even a kitten diet in the short term nutrition is always better than nothing but obviously in the long term the more you can do to encourage your cat to eat the specially designed diet the better follow some of the other tips on this slide so also for example don't if your cat's feeling a bit unwell don't push a new diet onto them because they may associate that new diet with feeling ill and never ever want to eat it um, Talk to your vet clinic as well about any tips and tricks that they might have for encouraging a new food. Um, home prepared diets are an option, but only with involvement of a veterinary nutritionist, not something that I, um, I would otherwise recommend that you do because of course you could produce a very unbalanced diet which would be unsafe for your cat in the long term. And where possible, a wet food. But if your cat is a real dry food addict, then the specially designed kidney diets that are dry formulation are the best thing still so they are still better than a uh, a wet supermarket diet for example there are some other tips and tricks for supporting appetite in your cat so um, I've included a, a few on this sl slide things like sitting with your cat hand feeding your cat putting a little bit of food perhaps on a paw for them to look off um, if they're feeling very poorly all these sort of things can help um, catnip if your cat likes catnip a little bit of dried catnip on the food can be helpful um, make sure that you do if you're offering things that are a little bit sort of off piste um, that you avoid anything that might be toxic to your cat um, and classic examples of that would be things containing onions or garlic so the thing to be careful here would be if you for example go to your supermarket and buy a freshly cooked chicken um, be aware that a lot of these are basted in, in very delicious onion and garlic mixtures obviously designed for human consumption but could actually be quite toxic to your cat so so really avoid those and and either cook the food yourself or, or use something where um, so you know that no onions or garlic have been involved and again in the short term even if your cat will only eat prawns for a day or two um, that is better than no food at all Phosphate binders I also mentioned as being helpful with the phosphate restriction so these substances are particularly helpful if your cat won't eat at one of these specially designed diets or if their blood phosphate levels stay higher than we would like in spite of us successfully transitioning them onto a kidney diet and as I mentioned they're designed to be given in the food they bind to the phosphate in the food and stop that from being absorbed and there are a number of different options available through your vets and also through online uh, pet pharmacies um, different formulations so for example pronephra is a liquid quite a palatable liquid often popular um, but renate is a powder form um, also does seem very popular as well but different cats will, will uh, perhaps respond differently to the different binders um, my main top tip with these is to start with just a small amount um, you want to uh, phosphate bind in every meal the cat eats but just start with a tiny amount and work up to the recommended dose 
way back when I did my owner questionnaire, um, I asked also for their tips on acceptance of phosphate binders. Um, and they had lots of very, very sensible tips, which are just appearing on your screen just now. Uh, my personal favorite was the, the last of the tips to appear, which I do believe is, is really a very valid tip. Um, this is the add to the food when the cat is not looking. You will all know that if you behave in any way suspiciously or what the cat might interpret as suspiciously, then they know that something's amiss. So this, the whole idea of, of subterfuge, I think, is very important when it comes to our cats. So uh, be a bit gentle in your approach and, and, uh, uh, and perhaps out of the cat's eyesight. Other treatments that might be recommended? Well, I mentioned the RAS suppression. So that's the two medications uh, that your vet may discuss with you there. Um, but hydration support, I talked about encouraging your cat to drink. But on the right hand side, we've got a picture of a cat having fluids given under the skin. And this can be a helpful technique that actually can be done at home if need be by the carer and again we've got a, a download on my website that shows how to do this obviously it's only something that you would do on the recommendation and advice of your vets but for cats that are very vulnerable to becoming dehydrated this can be an incredibly helpful way of really maintaining their health and maintaining their quality of life and then beyond that really it depends on the individual so whether they need appetite support or anemia support or perhaps treatments for, for nausea or vomiting. Um, so again, a lot of things that, that may be an option uh, depending on your individual cats. And as always, it's really, I think these are the situations where it's important to work closely with your vet clinic and work out what your cat needs and how you can best provide it. Long-term outlook for, for many cats with CKD is extremely good, as I've hopefully already emphasized on a, a number of occasions. However, it is actually unpredictable. So um, certainly at the time of diagnosis, um, I think we, we have to be open-minded about how things will go and obviously keep fingers and toes crossed that everything will go well. Um, for many cats it will, but of course there are some cats that are less fortunate and have more rapidly progressing kidney disease. The checkups I think are really crucial to ensure optimum care and really make sure that everyone in the team, which is yourself and the vet clinic, really understands your cat and their particular needs. So that means closely monitoring things like body weight, appetite, all the sort of clinical signs that, that might be present in your cat. Also keeping a close eye on things like blood pressure for development of high blood pressure and the blood and urine tests as well for evidence of progression of disease, but also new complications that might benefit from being managed. There are lots of things that carers can do at home to help. Uh, one thing that I do think is worthwhile considering is investing in some paediatric scales um, so that you can weigh your cat at home. And this is whether your cat is, is healthy or unwell. Actually, it can be helpful to just have some scales at home so you can monitor body weight. In a cat with CKD, I wouldn't generally weigh them more often than once a week. Um, and for a healthy old cat, perhaps weighing them once a month or once every three months is, is perfectly adequate. If you look at uh, online stores and search for baby scales, you'll find quite a lot of, of models that are, I think, relatively inexpensive to buy. And then you can, you can monitor your cat's weight at home. Uh, if you do see that the weight is, is going in a downward direction, that is definitely cause for concern. Even if it's only inching down, uh, if each measurement is lower than the one before, uh, I would be worried. Keeping a diary can also be very helpful. Um, you can then provide that data to your vet clinic when you go in for checkups and, and we can work out where perhaps extra support might be needed. Also remember to, uh, to ask your clinic for support. If, if you feel that perhaps things aren't going as well as you would like, perhaps giving a medication is a struggle, talk to your vet clinic because there may well be a different formulation of the medication that you will find easier to give or that your cat will prefer and that your vet clinic can talk to you about. And finally, there, of course, are online a number of really useful websites that have a lot of information. So the Feline Friends website has got lots of really lovely information for pet owners. International Cat Care, I already mentioned they have a huge uh, amount of information and my website as well. Um, also possibly of interest um, may be that I offer a referral service uh, by telephone to cat owners wanting to discuss the care of their cat in more detail. So. Um, 
you don't need to be living in Scotland to benefit uh, potentially from my advice and expertise. Um, if you feel that your cat perhaps you're not completely happy with um, how they're doing or you want to have a bit more advice and support, um, then that's something you can consider and there is information on that on my website uh, and you can also email my, me about that. And for those of you that really want to sink your teeth into something scientific, um, freely available uh, to Google and download are the ISFM consensus guidelines on diagnosis and management of feline CKD. This screenshot at the bottom right uh, of that, which uh, these are guidelines written for vets, so they are scientific guidelines, but actually probably um, largely still understandable um, by um, even those without a, a sort of veterinary background, and you might find an interesting resource uh, to consult. So thank you very much for bearing with me and uh, letting me talk about a topic which uh, I do find um, very, very close to my heart for all the reasons that I hope have come across in this webinar. Um, if you would like a, a PDF of my slides, then please do feel free to email me. And as long as you mention feline friends and CKD webinar, I will know which presentation to send you. Um, and I'll also be very happy now to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And I'm sure everyone tuning in will agree there was some uh, really, really, it was really, really useful uh, webinar, uh, a great overview of uh, CKD and then obviously um, how we can, as um, cat owners, help with the management of that. Um, as Sarah says, she's happy to take some questions. So please do pop them in the Q&A box and uh, we can post some questions uh, pose some questions sorry to sarah shortly um i suppose one thing for me while people are putting in their questions um, sarah is obviously we're talking around the diet there um and obviously that's quite you know, easier to manage if they're a house cat but if they're a cat like mine that likes to go out wandering about you know i suppose <laughs> the answer is it's very difficult but how can we sort of obviously manage their diet when they may be going to a couple of other houses and getting some little treats and bits and pieces from other homes as well as obviously from the primary home? Is there anything we can do to try and curb that or uh, manage it more effectively? Uh, yes, it can, it can be difficult, obviously. I, I think probably for many cats with CKD, they, they tend to be older cats that perhaps are less sort of wide ranging in their free roaming so perhaps tend to tootle more around their own garden and the house rather than than going too far from home but of course if you do know that your cat regularly visits neighbors a b and c um, then it's probably a good idea to have a chat with them and maybe give them some of the special food and say well if my cat comes in can you try and feed it this food uh, rather than the food that you might have in your house for your cats um, you of course can't completely stop them eat, eating whatever they might want to eat um, but any effort you can make to encourage them to just eat that that specially designed food uh, will definitely pay off in terms of their health fantastic thank you so uh, i've got one question here from melanie melanie says she's got a 15 year old which was diagnosed with early stage she's kd last year uh, she's tried him on various brands of renal wet food none of which he's very keen on the only uh, thing he seems to like are the renal biscuits uh, but melanie is concerned uh, what impact a dry diet will have on the condition will this be okay should i keep trying with different wet foods uh, I ensure he has access to lots of water supplies. Brilliant. I mean, there certainly are quite a few cats that just love the renal biscuits and, and aren't so keen on the wet food. And in general, I would say as long as your cat's hydration is OK, which it probably is because uh, that's not something you specifically mentioned, then it's still absolutely brilliant that they're getting a renal diet. Um, the fact that it's dry, well, obviously, if you could sit down and have a sort of man to man chat with your cat, you, you know, and wag your finger at them, you would say, now, look here, you really should should eat a wet food it'd be much better for you um, but the dry food will be doing absolutely masses of good um, by providing lots of water sources you are also helping to support um, drinking um, have a look at the free download on my website and see if there's any other tips in there for encouraging fluid intake uh, for example 
there's some advice on the sort of water bowls that cats tend to prefer, um, how to make a, a flavoured broth for your cat, for example. Um, but also, uh, if as time progresses, hydration becomes more of an issue, talk to your vets as well about subcutaneous fluids as an option. Um, but uh, certainly lots and lots of cats, just to reassure you, do, do brilliantly on a dry renal diet only. And whilst, as I say, the wet would be preferable in many ways, um, you know, if your cat's eating a renal diet, that is absolutely brilliant. That is, you know, by, by far and away, you're the, the most important thing. No problem. Fantastic. Um, a few people have been asking for the link. So I have posted uh, the link to your website to be able to download the um, the samples, etc. Uh, in the chat box. So if you have a look uh, in the chat section, you'll see there's a link to Sarah's website there. So you can click directly from that through to the website. Um, so what else have we got coming in here? We've got a lot of just very positive comments. Uh, thank you most sincerely, Sarah. This has been an outstanding lecture, very clearly presented. Uh, Hester's been on to say, amazing as always, well informed and easy to understand. You're the best vet in the world. Love Hester, Hump and Samson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I've got a question here from Veronica. She says, how do you manage the constipation that some of the phosphorus binders cause? That's a great question. And um, you're absolutely right that constipation is quite a common issue in cats with CKD. Partly the phosphate binders and also partly can be an issue because of hydration. Um, so encouraging that water intake definitely helps. However, it, there are a lot of cats that need more than that. Um, something that I've used a lot recently, which is is I think only just filtering onto the vet scene, so may or may not have reached uh, your and your vet steers yet, but is um, a, an osmotic laxative called PEG3350, that's its sort of biochemical name. Um, and it's actually uh, not, well, uh, there's one supply producing a vet form of it, um, but it's, it's, you'll be more familiar with it perhaps as a product aimed at people. It's Movicol, Macrogol, um, those sorts of names. So it's something used widely in human medicine. Um, a reformulating company called Bova, that's B-O-V-A, actually produces a vet form now of this PEG3350. And it's a powder which I find really helpful because it seems to be innocuous really undetectable by the cat um, and you can add a little bit to the food it doesn't seem to notice it and it really helps in softening the stool and easing constipation so I would say have a chat with your vets about that as an option and if they seem to be a little bit um, unaware um, then definitely be tolerant of that because as I say it's only really just filtering onto the vet's, vet scene um, but I have some resources for vets which um, if you wish I can send you and you can show to your vets um, and of course they can contact me for further information as well if that's helpful but that's certainly something I've found really useful um, um, uh, the traditional osmotic laxative for, for use in cats is lactulose, which again is used in human medicine. Probably many of you will have had it or seen it. Um, for the average cat, it's not very popular because this sort of syrupy liquid is, is not very cat friendly. And this is where I find this PEG 3350 powder um, really, really helpful. So feel free to contact me if I can be more help there. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few more questions so um, to get asked through. So I don't think we'll have any more time to ask any more questions after what we've already received, uh, but we will try and get through these few that we've got in here now. Um, so let's have a look. Um, so uh, we've got one lady saying, my cat is 11 years old, uh, seven with CKD. Now Iris, fourth stage with azotemia, has hydro excuse me for the uh, pronunciation ha uh, hydrophonosis is it caused by scar tissue in the urethra of one of his kidneys uh, he's with renal food um fluids with b complex daily besides everything you said is there anything else i can do to help him sounds like you're doing a fabulous job um i mean obviously um very advanced renal disease and with you know sadly good reasons uh, with that um hydronephrosis um, but uh, no, I mean, obviously, without a full clinical history, um, I, I can't spot any obvious holes. If your cat's doing well in themselves, I would say just you are doing a brilliant job. Um, if you have any, any sort of concerns, then first step, obviously, speak, speak to your vets. 
um, about support and also bear in mind that uh, I have this telephone referral service if you feel that that would be helpful then then of course feel free to get in touch about that as well no problem thank you very much um gain is asking uh saying fantastic presentation thank you she has a cat who's been treated for hypothyroid for two years who has now developed ckd also gets a lot of gi problems causing him to stop eating would this be the medication or the disease process itself uh, and then she's followed that up just to say that she's just managed to get him started on cementra for his kidneys urea is 30 and creatine is 398 t4 Okie doke, sorry, I've just uh, been jotting that down, <laughs> hence the pause. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it, yeah, sadly, it's quite common to have that combination of thyroid and kidney disease, and that does make life more challenging. Also, the, the gastrointestinal issues, um, older cats quite, uh, I think, vulnerable to, to GI issues in general. Uh, that can be because of a pancreatic problem. So pancreatitis can be a sort of grumbling issue in the background that can affect your cat's appetite and cause vomiting and, and, and other problems. So these sort of patients are, are typically quite complicated to manage and it can be quite a difficult juggle to sort of balance everything um, and again this is the sort of case where understanding the cat and sort of really feeling that you you know what seems to work for them um, is almost more important than sometimes what's written in a textbook and and working closely with your vets to find for example are there certain diets which seem to not upset the tummy quite so much or are there certain diets that are you know particularly bad and should be avoided but it there's no generic advice sadly there's no magic wand either um but i would just say work closely with your vets and um and and provide them with all the information and have you know sensible discussions about whether there are little tweaks you can make that will help make a difference for example if your cat won't tolerate a kidney food because of, of the other issues um, then bear in mind things like the phosphate binders can help and also you can supplement with uh, b vitamins and potassium in other ways as well uh, than the kidney diet so there are lots of things that you can do to support but it, it will vary according to the individual challenges okay fantastic thank you very much um nicola saying um What's your view of Royal Canin rehydration support? Um, she provides it to her cat when she's unwell and stops drinking. She doesn't have CKD, but is possibly more at risk as she needs uh, Prednica on a daily basis. Is uh, you know, Royal Canin the rehydration support a useful um, you know, supplement to have to uh, support this? So there, there are a, a variety of sort of uh, oral hydration um, products out there. Often the challenge I, I find is actually that cats not liking them, but if they do accept them, they certainly can be helpful. They're obviously not nutritionally providing much in the in the sense of calories but the the importance is more in terms of fluids and hydration and if you do have a cat that's vulnerable to dehydration or that you have some some concerns over um then and they will and they will drink this then then that's brilliant so uh, if you found something that works uh, for you i would i would definitely support that um, and if you find that you've tried the raw cannon one and that doesn't work for you there are there are other ones so oralite is is another example liquivite is slightly more nutritional other example mm -hmm. as well so there's a, a variety of these different sort of um, electrolyte uh, hydration mixtures and, and sort of soupy cat foods as well to consider fantastic thank you um you've got the phosphorus binder uh, if the cat won't eat it with the food even when it's really well mixed in is it something that you can syringe directly in or is it something that does have to be mixed with food you can syringe it into the cat. Um, uh, the only th um, sort of uh, uh, comment to make really is that it, it has to be very close to that meal time. So if you, let's say, syringed it into the cat um, and the cat hadn't eaten for two hours and didn't eat for another two hours, mm -hmm. that is really a waste of time. Mm -hmm. But if your cat, for example, will eat the food and you've seen them eat the food and you can then syringe the binder into them, then that should work well. So yes, that is definitely a possible solution for cats that for whatever reason won't take the binder in the food. Sometimes putting binder with dry food 
food can be a bit more challenging because obviously you can't mix it in as much. And I've heard um, a number of, of carers will say that if you put the, the dry food into a, a, a plastic food bag and add the binder and give it a bit of a shake and that works fine. Mm -hmm. But other cats that seem to detect, you know, something on the surface and perhaps those ones are, are ones that you might end up syringing the binder to separately. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of preventative versus, you know, um, actually, you know, challenging it, um, is it worth the question coming in? Is it worth the um, when a cat reaches about the age of ten to start it on like a KD diet, or can it, um, you know, and use it as more of a preventative, or is it just keep going until the signs of CKD start to uh, appear? Uh, that's a really superb question and I don't think we really know the answer is the honest thing to say. There's certainly a little bit of data um, more recently that um, a a sort of senior cat food so a diet that is a little bit phosphate restricted um, can be helpful in the very very early stages of kidney disease in stabilizing it so I would say there is good rationale behind feeding a senior diet but probably not uh, to go as far as a therapeutic renal diet until um, more obvious signs of kidney disease are apparent and, and your vet is advising it the main sort of downsides, if you like, and the reason I'm saying that as opposed to, to recommending a kidney diet is um, that firstly, the, the renal diets, as I mentioned earlier, are often are quite high in fat. So if your cat um, is a little bit overweight, let's say, and you feed it a renal diet, you may make their weight problem harder to manage. Um, but also but from an evidence perspective, we, we don't at the moment have evidence to say it, it will protect them from kidney disease. But I do think, as I say, that a senior diet is, is a sensible thing to follow for your, for your older cats, definitely for cats aged 11 years and over, I think a senior diet is, is sensible fantastic that's great thank you very much right uh, two more questions and we'll wrap up because i know the um, there's a, been a lot of interest there you've uh, stimulated a lot of conversation here but i know that um we obviously need to move on so two last questions and then um we'll wrap it up for the evening uh so first of all um amy's got an eight-year-old indoor siamese recently di diagnosed with ckd uh, would you start supplements or any form of medication straight away or try the diet first? Well, the most proven thing is the the diet. So mm -hmm. where at all possible, uh, I would transition your cat on to a therapeutic renal diet obviously have you know discuss it with your vet as well because if there are any other health issues that might have an impact they, they may have other recommendations as well but 99 times out of 100 uh, the best thing to do for a, for a cat with ckd is is to get them onto that therapeutic diet and that is more proven than any supplements that's that's ever been produced uh, for cats and and obviously in the future that might change but at the moment the the really the proven thing is the diet so i would say if, if you can put all your energy into that I, I believe you really genuinely are doing the very best for your cat fantastic um and then one this question it's one that um you know cat owners never want to think about but in terms of indicators to help you decide when it's time to euthanize you know is there a sort of you know is it a scoring chart is it more of a the owner knowing what standard of life the individual's got is there any sort of indicators you can give there to help that sort of decision making process yes you're you're absolutely right it is you know your heart sinks at the thought of this really doesn't it but of course if your cat is diagnosed with something like ckd this you know it actually is a sensible thought to cross your mind mm -hmm. um i would say actually that um you know as doctors uh, often say you know trust your maternal instincts when it comes to your, your children or your paternal instincts as well i should say um you know really do tr trust your trust your gut um that that goes a long way um even um, there are scoring systems and there are ways of, of, of uh, grading quality of life um, and they fall really into a, a lot of things that you, you will know just by looking at your cat you know your cat has it has it got a sad face is it looking a bit withdrawn is it still eating and drinking and going to the toilet is it doing the things it normally used to do was if your cat liked its morning walk around the garden and sniffing the air or looking out of a window are they still doing all those sorts of things when quality of life 
drops below a point where you know they're not showing their normal behaviors and or they're looking to be in discomfort then uh definitely that's a time to to talk with your vets i mean there, there may well be things that can be done and that that you can lift your cat out of that again um but of course uh if it comes to a point where you run out of options then um that's where euthanasia is is the kindest thing and and i i think it we are generally you know i think we're very lucky to be able to consider that for um our beloved pets you know yep. that when we can't help them that there is still that option available mm-hmm. um but there, as i say there's a lot of th- things but i think it does come down to trusting your instincts a, a lot would you almost say like keeping a diary so you almost benchmark what is a you know a day-to-day you know, usual standard and then obviously they can it's an opportunity to look back on what that diary say and to see how it has progressed over a period of time as well yeah i think that can be helpful i think the difficulty is with the, the slow decline is always the worry of well you know i don't want to let things linger too far but how do i know whether today is the day but often the reality is that i think you 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 do know Uh, i think for most people you do and and if you have a good working relationship with your vet i think really involve them in that as well if you feel uncertain and you're not sure whether to trust your instincts speak to your vets not necessarily even taking your cat to see them but speak to them on the phone or in, in person have that sort of discussion as well because if they've known your cat for several years and been treating it you know they they will also be able to reassure and support and advise you as well fantastic well i'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there so uh well, just a few thank yous thank you firstly um to all yourselves for uh joining us this evening i'm sure they agree it's been a fantastic presentation and uh, sarah has been a uh, superb in terms of dealing with your, the questions as well so uh thank you very much for engaging because it really is a two-way thing to make these uh webinars as useful as possible for yourselves um thank you to obviously sarah uh, for given time to present this evening um there are i say i've put a link in the chat um sarah's e- uh, sorry email address is on the screen at the moment so if you do have any questions uh, sarah is happy for you to uh, send her an email so please do send it to that but also put in feline friends ckd webinar so uh, sarah does know uh, where the questions are coming from and she can send you the um the uh, PDF of the presentation for this evening as well. It will also be available on the Feline Friends uh, website uh, within the next few days for you to refer back to. Obviously, thank you to Feline Friends as well for their continued uh, support and sponsorship of this series of webinars, uh, really designed to improve the uh, well-being, health and care of um, our cats. So uh, thank you once again to Feline Friends and thank you to my colleague uh, Luke who's been on the other end helping with all the technical inquiries. So thank you very much. So all these me say is good night and God bless and uh, I look forward to welcoming you on a Feline Friends webinar in the near future. Good night. <laughs>